On January the 16th, 2018, Jordan Peterson had his famous clash with Kathy Newman, the moment when he broke through to the mainstream and the spark for the Jordan Peterson phenomenon. But it wasn't the only interview he did that day. Shortly afterwards, he went to the Royal Society for the Arts, one of the UK's premier think tanks. Good afternoon, everyone. For a conversation with the philosopher and chess grandmaster, Jonathan Rowson. My job was to you know, challenge him a bit, find out what he's really trying to say. Um, he can speak beautifully. The audience show up to buy his book and hear him give a great performance. He'd done that hundreds of times before. He'd do it again. Um, but this was a bit different. And uh, I even said to him before we went on, I'm, if it's okay, I'll try and challenge. He says, of course, of course. He was keen for all that. His rule six says, make sure your own house is in perfect order before you criticize the world. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a dark chapter, that one. Dark, yeah, mm. and challenging and mm. controversial, and I, I didn't agree with most of it. You know, much of, I admire m most of the book and the ideas in it. I had tra challenges here, so I'll try and explain what I think they okay. are. When you say to a whole new generation, take responsibility, they're like, well, yeah, but my, my fear is that we're going to be inundated with climate change. My fear is that private actors like Google and Facebook now control the public realm. My fear is that artificial intelligence is getting way too intelligent and is actually well, really risking things on the world. I have another fear for you. Here's a fear. Right. Your attempts to fix that will make it worse. Well, okay, That's the, this is the question, the heart right. of the matter. So right. on the one hand, you say, look, you don't know, have a clue what you're doing. Stay out of it, right? But we live in democratic systems where it's our responsibility not to stay out of it. Mm -hmm. So how do you manage that? Because you seem to be saying... With leave humility. it humility. Humility, right. But humility doesn't preclude activism. Uh, generally, it does, yes, but, Why? Uh, but Why that, does doesn't mean, that doesn't mean that I'm saying that there is no situations under which political action or activism is justified, because there are clearly situations under which it's justified. But it's not the first thing that you should be taught how to do when you're an 18-year-old person going to university and right. you don't know a damn thing. So I don't doubt that there's callow youth. I don't doubt that people have a lot to learn. And that, yeah, and they're and not that, learning it from their professors either. That may be true. So I thought the day had gone really well, right? I went home. Uh, and I just thought, oh, I wonder what people are saying. And it's on YouTube. And suddenly I was like the outcast. I was completely flogged verbally for all sorts of things to how I was interrupting him, to what I was wearing, to how I didn't understand him, how dare I challenge the professor. The reaction online was totally polarized between people who hated his lines of questioning and others who were glad to see a real debate. In the aftermath, Jonathan spent months reflecting on the encounter and ended up writing an epic paper all about how he contracted and cured himself of what he called Jordan Petersonitis. I was very intrigued by the fact that the way the response was mobilized was one of, do you approve of him or not? Now that's the wrong question, right? If you want a mature culture that's learning from intellectual phenomena that are going on, the question is much more, look, why are so many people captivated? What is he saying that might be of interest? If you're not captivated, if you don't get it, what might you be missing, right? That's the kind of question you would ask people to say. Equally, those who are captivated should be curious about those who are not. The lack of curiosity about him amongst my peer group or my professional colleagues, uh, it's like, aren't you, aren't you a bit curious to know why millions of people seem to think he's so impressive? And they're not, and it, it bothers me. It's like, that's weird, you know? We met in the woods of West London to reflect on the experience. So Jonathan, you're a philosopher, you're also a chess grandmaster, and you're head of Perspectiva. But the reason we're having this conversation is that you had uh, an interview with Jordan Peterson beginning of 2018 now. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit about that, kind of recap. Let's start with the, what's really interesting as well is that this interview was immediately after the Kathy Newman interview. And we've got like a real shared history around for many different reasons. We, our work, your work, and my interests cover a lot of the same territory that Jordan Peterson is covering. Um, the role of spirituality, the role of religion in society, the role of the sacred, all of these questions. So we were both hugely affected by it. And you wrote this piece, An Epistemic Thunderstorm, and coined the term Jordan Petersonitis. And it feels appropriate now three years on for us to have this conversation to just explore what it meant yeah. and as you said the lessons we learned and the lessons we didn't learn um, so maybe before we go into that let's let's maybe frame this conversation what are you hoping to get from this conversation oh a little bit of 
catharsis maybe a little bit of you know it was three and a half years well it's almost three and a half it's a good period of time and it was very intense at the time so looking back now from a sort of safe and comfortable distance is part of it so to enjoy the reflection of that because we were both heavily involved at the time to hear a little bit more from you about what you went through and you know how Jordan Peterson influenced Rebel Wisdom the different moments of sort of uh, excitement and intrigue combined with maybe distrust or wariness around him um, the impact on our social surround and how you know what what people were saying about him and how that chimed or didn't with what I was experiencing the writing process of making sense of it and how difficult it was to really get to the bottom of my own feelings about it um, but more broadly since we are three and a half years down the line like what what did we fail to learn like what what was going on there that we didn't adequately pay attention to now that it's no longer about Peterson as such what was the Peterson phenomenon about such that a little bit time downstream we can maybe you know pick up something that we lost along the way. I love your phrase, an epistemic thunderstorm. And I've used the term, a one man lightning rod for the culture war, the Jordan Peterson phenomenon. And it was an extraordinary time. And I think is still, there's so many different layered, there's so many different layered pieces within it. Um, my piece, the glitch in the matrix, which came out in 2018, looked at the Kathy Newman interview from these sort of different layers of like the clash between the the, the mainstream media and the alternative media and then the, the kind of gender dynamics that were going on underneath that conversation, all of these different topics. And it was so multi-layered and archetypal even back then. And I remember talking to Richard Tarnas, the archetypal thinker, about Jordan Peterson is certainly carrying some kind of archetypal force. I see him as, I think some of the force that's coming through him is uh, collective. It's, he is a he is a kind of channel for things that haven't been said for a while uh, and that uh, in some sense uh, needed to be said. It's a, you know, he's a, he's a kind of channel of the return of the repressed in that sense. And people have, there's so many different kind of frames. There's like the father energy that he was carrying. There was the sort of the sense of that he was a, in some ways he was sort of crowdsourced, like he was a genuine internet celebrity that sort of then erupted into the mainstream the mainstream just wasn't sure what to do with this at all um, and there was the sense of him re representing this kind of insurgency against this sort of um, what I would call a kind of low resolution liberal mainstream worldview and kind of pulled apart quite a lot in in on rebel wisdom um, but the first the first thing I think would be worth covering because it's something you covered in your piece as well is like this tendency that we have to almost immediately split into pro and anti yeah. and like this tendency in public culture to do that and, and what that means like how we lose any opportunity to to learn from that because everyone's immediately like oh i don't like this or i do like this and do you want to yeah start that, there? To, to be honest that's the heart of the matter i think because that was the experience of the time uh, peterson appeared as if out of nowhere I know that you'd seen him coming, I mean, to your credit, you'd noticed what was happening. And maybe what others didn't notice is that he also had this sort of 20 year history of studying mythology and depth psychology. And those two things together made him this sort of sensation. Um, but really, the, 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 the way people reacted to Peterson was the problem. So I, I should say early on, like, the issue is not whether you're yay or nay, right? It's not, people are looking for that. People want to know do you like him or don't you like him? And it's a really troublesome way of framing things. It's very human. It's a kind of very tribal approach. Do you think he's one of us or is he not one of us? Do you think he's safe or is he unsafe? That question never really occurred to me for, some, for whatever reason. What I saw when he sort of first came to prominence was someone who was very intriguing, um, quite captivating to listen to, um, very intense, um, that he had a, a certain kind of following and he was rubbing certain kinds of people up the wrong way. Um, and at that point I was just observing, not really sure what was going on. But I noticed even from the very early moments, like pre Kathy Newman interview, before that moment, he was already quite controversial, already written about in lots of prominent papers. And I think uh, I was troubled by the fact that people weren't asking, what's he saying? Why is it relevant? Is there something of value here? Those questions weren't really there. What was going on was, um, something about he's doing this for the young men. That was like one quick story that people latched onto. Or 
he's doing this because he's against the sort of woke left liberal um, uh, people who are just, you know, flaky and fluffy. And he's, he's back here to get things real and take things seriously. And also he was against the kind of pseudo activism of people who say, claim to be claiming the, saving the world when they can't tidy his room and tidy their room in his language. So I was very intrigued by the fact that the way the response was mobilized was one of, do you approve of him or not? Now that's the wrong question, right? If you want a mature culture that's learning from intellectual phenomena that are going on, the question is much more, look, why are so many people captivated? What is he saying that might be of interest? If you're not captivated, if you don't get it, what might you be missing, right? That's the kind of question you would ask people to say. Equally, those who are captivated should be curious about those who are not. What are they seeing? Or repulsed. Maybe, is the or other repulsed, side. yeah, exactly, yeah. stronger than that. Those who just think this is a you know, misogynist, old-fashioned, privileged, patriarchal white male who is telling everyone how to behave, we're done with that, get over it, right? That's also there. And this was happening, but I was so disappointed by the kind of lack of let's learn from this approach um, and so three and a half years later, it's a bit easier to do that. But at the time, there was just heat, uh, not so much light. Yeah, and this conversation could go, like there's so many different directions it can go in, and there's so many different topics to unpack. So maybe let's start with a kind of chronology. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned that I um, first saw him in 2017. I think Alexander Bard was the first person who mentioned him to, to me. Right. And, and then I, I started listening to his lectures, like, genuinely like captivated i listened to the, the maps of meaning series in particular and i still think that that over and above certainly far over and above the books that came out since like there's something compelling about the way that he speaks that the the, the vision the all-encompassing vision that was laid out and that was just so compelling and it tapped into so many things that i was already um aware of like the sort of the deeper mythology the jungian perspective and it was it was like and i I think we were in touch then, and I wrote this piece about Jordan Peterson for Perspectiva, yeah, your yeah, organization. Yeah, 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 gosh. So we'd just been, we were, we were quite young, looking for new material and new authors. You weren't, Rebel Wisdom hadn't yet formed. And the title of the piece was, didn't hold back. It was something like, can this man save Western civilization from itself? Or why this man can save Western civilization? Um, and I was like, oh, we'll, we'll, we'll publish that because it's kind of, you know, intriguing. What on earth could he be saying that, you know, earns him that kind of accolade. When I first saw his work, I, w I felt immediately this is the message that we need to hear right now. There was something of, of like, I put all of my chips on Peterson. I was like, this thing is going to go viral. It was sort of this sense of like, this is exactly what we need right, right now because it fit this hole in the culture yeah. perfectly. It was like, it was the deeper story of Western, Western culture. It was taking on the new atheists in their own on their own turf mm -hmm, which is something mm -hmm, that mm -hmm. um we'll come to a little bit more in a minute because this is sure. you wrote that amazing piece for the rsa uh, spiritualized mm -hmm, i think mm -hmm. where you looked at spirituality and culture and so you've you've also kind of been very keen on yeah. on on this perspective um so yeah i wrote this piece for perspectiva that then got me the interview with jordan peterson because i sent him the piece oh, he, he really liked that. it okay, that's good. he really liked it i went out to to yeah. Canada in at the end of 2017 got an interview with him that I then turned into the documentary Truth in the Time of Chaos right. and then three or four days after that came out the Kathy Newman interview happened right. while I was out in Thailand yep. um, and I was in touch with you because you were then you were due to have this right. conversation with him at the RSA which yep. happened on the same day as the Kathy Newman interview yep. and then why the I've said this a few times in public, but for me, it's still absolutely extraordinary that the main topic of my conversation with Jordan Peterson was Jung, synchronicities, Jung, yeah. and how synchronicities are these amazing coincidences that tell us something about the deeper meaning of reality. And then he shoots to fame on the show, Channel 4 News, that I was working on yeah. for about 12 years with Kathy Newman, who I was working in the same newsroom as only a few weeks before. Well, never worked again in that newsroom after bringing out um, Truth in the Time of Chaos, which I knew at the time. Right. So I kind of deliberately ended one yeah, yeah. career by putting that out, right. thinking that, let's see if the roulette wheel comes back on right. Peterson and then Rebel Wisdom pretty much generated an audience by looking at the Jordan Peterson phenomenon right. and trying to make sense of it. Yeah. Um, so that's kind of but the backstory. I can say to your credit, David, that 
you know, not everyone else saw this coming. Like there was some luck along the way as there always is, but you know, it wasn't that obvious to everyone that the Peterson phenomenon would become what it was. Mm. A lot of people would just have you know, seen another, another university professor uh, with a little bit of controversy and that's it. But you had seen something about what was, what was waiting to be you know, spoken about. Mm. And he was the person, he, you know, the, the people were ready for something like the message and he was the messenger. But I mean, I should just say before we get too far into this, uh, you know, I have huge reservations about Peterson and I, I had them very early on and just amongst, you know, my, my wife, my friends, my family, people who were let's just listen to him and were a bit wary, uh, something about his demeanor um, being a little sharp and a little too intense and hyper masculine and, you know, this, this sort of language was going around. So I wasn't, I was never at a moment where I thought absolutely sure this guy is what we need. Um, and I think maybe early on, it was somewhat different for you. I would say that we're in a different place now, which is why it feels like the right time to have this conversation. We are in a different place than we were in 2018. Like he felt like the right key for the right particular lock back then. Um, At least he could have been, maybe, but yeah. I'm not sure it worked out. But that also, way. I think there was a trajectory that we'll come into later that I feel like, and you pointed to in your essay, that in some of his work, you can see him pointing a way beyond the culture war dynamic. And then in other ways, you can see right, that he yeah. became a culture warrior mm. and was deepening that dynamic right. um, for matters of temperament or for positions that he took or all of this sort of stuff that I think we'll get to yeah. in, a, in a bit. Um, but you want to stick to the chronology? Um, maybe let's, yeah. Well, I just wanted to well, just, you, let's just go go to your Let's go to your I can go to my, how it came to me. But the, 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 I mean, how it came to me was, one, I think I was told in sort of late December that I'd be doing this in January the 16th or something. So I had time to read his book, uh, which frankly, I don't think is that great as a book. I think the prose is kind of prolix, you know, it's difficult to get through. Um, and you often had this feeling in each of the 12 chapters that he was really himself in, in terms of pointing out lots of problems. And then towards the end of the chapter, he sort of lightened up. But you could very much see the difference in voice in the book. So I felt as though the editor, I could really feel the editor's presence in the last part of each chapter. As, he, as the editor was almost saying, like, give the reader something positive to take away from this. Because as you know, Peterson is, as he said himself, quite a dark, even depressive temperament that he's fought with and admirably so at times. But the book, you really feel that. So I didn't really enjoy the book, if I'm honest. But nonetheless, I didn't really care because I'd already seen a lot of the videos. And that's where Peterson actually is at his best. And this is the thing that I think lots of people who don't like Peterson or find they're allergic to him in some way, never really grasped, I think, that he's primarily a theatrical spoken performer who just happens to be a seasoned prof professional, both a professor mostly of social psychology and a clinical psychologist. So he has forms of expertise. And then he has this historic book, Maps of Meaning, written 20 years before, um, which was barely read, I, I suspect, because it's so kind of arcane and it's very long and it's not easy to get through. But he turned that into these lectures. And so when, what, what Peter, people were responding to with Peterson was this kind of intensity. He speaks as if life as such is at stake. And that's, new, that's pretty new. I mean, there's a line by, a line by Richard Rorty, the, the pragmatist philosopher. He says, the chief instrument of cultural change is not arguing well, but speaking differently. And I think the thing about Peterson that people maybe didn't grasp until too late was, I'm not sure he actually was saying that much of substance. There is some substance, don't get me wrong. But primarily it was the tenor and the captivating, intense, reckoning style quality of his speech that people were just mesmerized by. Like, I don't know what he's saying exactly, but I'm intrigued. Because whatever it is, he seems to really care about it. And maybe I could care about it too. So that was going on. And that's where I was. I was like, okay, what is that? Like, what is that intensity? What is he talking about? How can I distill this in a way that makes sense to me and to others? And so come January 16th, um, I was going back to my old employer. So I left the RSA maybe a year and a half or so before. Um, and that was interesting in itself. And the other thing that was going on is because I'd created Perspectiva, I was keen to generate our own material as, too. And I had a thought that an old sort of colleague and friend, Ian McGilchrist, who you know, is familiar to Rebel Wisdom, he might like to speak to Jordan Peterson and maybe vice versa. And it turned out that Jordan Peterson had heard Ian speak in Toronto or something, and he was very keen to speak. So through his agent, 
I tried to collab make this uh, itinerary for he'd arrive at this time, we'd do this interview first, then we'd have a break, then we'd go on stage, then we'd do this other interview. But then of course I'm the host, I'm in this unusual position. My job, encouraged by the RSA, but only, only gently encouraged, They're, they let hosts do what they want really, um, was to you know, challenge him a bit, find out what he's really trying to say. Um, he can speak beautifully, the audience show up to buy his book and hear him give a great performance. He'd done that hundreds of times before, he'd do it again. Um, but this was a bit different and uh, I even said to him before we went on, I'm, it's okay, I'll try and challenge. He says, of course, of course, he was keen for all that. Um, so I began introducing him uh, in a way that said, you know, this morning I, I think I said something about this morning I made sure that I was, I took the rubbish out and I'd sorted my house out and I, I wore a tie especially and I was sort of trying to sort of say I've taken the message on board about self-possession prior to any bigger issue. Um, it comes across as slightly phoning when I look back on it, but it was what it was. Um, and then we got talking and I was trying to sort of pin him down a little bit to what exactly he was saying. Um, and the conversation went, you know, you've seen it and you, you know, it got quite heated several times, but it was always quite civil. You know, there was a sort of, I, I didn't feel during the conversation there was any hostility, but the, the atmosphere in the audience was charged. Um, and it was only after, then we went backstage and I arranged the interview with Ian and that's had over a million views and was kind of a perspective of success and they got on really well and it was a beautiful conversation to watch it unfold. And then his wife had drawn a little, um, you know, sketch of me and it was all very amicable. So I thought the day had gone really well, right? And this is where the other side of Peterson comes in because I went home uh, and I just thought, oh, I wonder what people are saying. And it's on YouTube. And, Suddenly I was like the outcast. I was completely flogged verbally for all sorts of things to how I was interrupting him, to what I was wearing, to how I didn't understand him, how dare I challenge the professor. And I was like, whoa, what is, what is this? And it got worse and worse and it went on for days and days. Uh, and then there were spin-off videos uh, and then people started to recognize me in the street. and blah, blah. Now, most of that was all right because I felt some kind of productive work had been done and a lot of people were also complimenting me for the challenge and so I knew it wasn't a disaster but you wouldn't know that from reading the YouTube comments. The YouTube comments are very one-sided. Um, anyway that happened and the next day to be honest I had a kind of you know I felt somewhat possessed if I'm honest like somewhat like there was an energy that wasn't altogether comfortable as if there had been something had taken place um, and it took a while to work through that. So I spent the next sort of six months-ish, obviously with other responsibilities, but just trying to write down what was that about. Not just the feeling, but the whole phenomenon and what I had to say, what it meant for Perspectiva. So I did that and that was the publication, yeah, so. And you coined Jordan Peterson Petersonitis, right. So that, that term, Petersonitis, that's what I had prior to interviewing him and to some extent afterwards. And it's to do with the cultural pressure to take a side. Um, but not really being able to, despite a lot of effort, right? So I define it more clearly and there's lots of symptoms in the paper, but the essence of it is the cultural pressure to say yay or nay to a public figure. Not being able to, because on the one hand he says things and he says things in a certain way that you like and you think we need more of that. On the other hand, you'll say something somewhat ridiculous or maybe a, maybe a bit banal sometimes also. And you think, well, I'm not so sure about him. And so, the problem is that that's normal, that's like human being behavior. People are not perfect and they'll say contradictory things and they will know, know some areas well and others not so well. But somehow he got caught up in this big sort of torrent of Peterson phenomenon that it was as if he was meant to have a whole world view sorted out already and he didn't. What he had was a certain forms of expertise and a certain rhetorical capacity and then he was expected to know everything about everything and he just didn't. Yeah, and we'll come to that. I mean, that, that's a conclusion that I've come to since, is that I think he got seduced by that sort of certainty, yeah. by that kind of feeling of certainty. And I think there was this sort of trajectory where that was what was expected of him. And I think he played into that. And right. I think that, was, that was, became very, very dangerous yeah. In, yeah. In, in retrospect. Um, but one other thing I was going to say is like, we both come from, um, an environment, because I think it'd be very easy to look at sort of Rebel Wisdom's content. I mean, we've, we've been 
um, relatively, like we've interrogated the Peterson phenomenon. We've had people on who've been critical of Peterson, probably not as much as some would, would want. Um, but we've put out pieces like the Peterson Paradox. I put out a piece saying it doesn't matter how, if you're right, if no one is listening. Um, and also, al although we've, we've kind of had a lot of success in terms of building an audience, there's also, there's also um, costs involved in, yeah. in saying that this guy's got something worth paying attention yeah. to, which I think you were aware of as well when, when you did this. And I've been very aware of as well. Like it's it's not one-sided. And it's you know, they speak about founder syndrome. It's not it's not as though Peterson is a founder of rebel wisdom at all. But but there is a sense in which it's hard to escape that, right? The energy was there. It gave you a big sort of trajectory and volume of material. You caught the wave and rode it. Um, but then you're sort of left with that audience and for good and bad. Um, so no, I can see the the challenge. Well, one thing I was going to say that's quite important, I think, the truth, right? Um, there's this lovely saying in courtroom dramas, I don't think they say it in the UK, but in the US, promise to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, right? So I think one way to understand Peterson is he's really into the truth, right? And he might even be into nothing but the truth, but he doesn't do the whole truth very well, right? I think that's one way to kind of critique him without sort of rejecting him entirely. This is, this is the core, I think, right. just doubling down on this, I think is the core, because as you'll know, we've talked before, like. My take on Peterson now is that he's necessary but not sufficient. Like I think everything that he is saying is, or an awful lot of what he is saying is absolutely necessary. The individual is necessary, but there is something more. And I think, I think that insufficiency is what we will hopefully talk to here and also bring in the developmental lens, right. which, so Perspectiva is really based around developmental thinking. So Piaget, um, Ken Wilber is another famous example, Robert Keegan, which is also very influential over, over Rebel Wisdom. And that developmental lens, I think, is something that was needed and missing yeah, the from the conversation around Jordan Peterson yeah. and also the conversation around the intellectual dark web, which kind of arose in the aftermath. Like, at what points was it a reactionary um, force pushing against the excesses of what Wilbur would call green postmodern culture? And where did it, where did it reach the point of a resolution of the implicit tensions within, between postmodernism and modernism? And that's a, an absolutely core map that I think if you don't have, you're pretty much stuck in a reactive frame. And that would be my critique of Jordan Peterson, is that at times, and especially at the beginning, when you, like when I interviewed him in 2017, he was a much more warm, welcoming, avuncular kind of person and then he became more and more kind of pinched more and more reactive as time went on um, and, and, to be and fair i know to people him, who were who not, were who were close to him saw this happen yeah, and, it, yeah. and i mean in a way it's like let's not be judgmental around that the amount of the amount of attention the amount of bad faith attacks the amount of criticism that was just unfair was intense but another thing that you said to kind of frame that is that often the argument isn't the argument the argument that so often I think a lot of the reaction to him was unfair. It was incorrect. It was put, pointing at the wrong things. But I think in some ways, there were things that were not fully expressed. Like the, the bad faith criticism obscured the good faith criticism. Right, right. So yeah, there was this kind of miasma of partial truth. And what I mean by that is on both sides, and by both, there are many sides, but for the sake of argument, um, those who were broadly in favor of Peterson, who felt he was a necessary and good thing, and those who felt, what is all the fuss about? He's, he's not even intellectually that coherent. Um, and he's also very reactionary. And they, they sort of, they were both partly right, you know. But the problem is that they held on to their partial truth without being interested in the other side of the story. So when I say he struggles with the whole truth, um, what I mean by that came up actually, I can explain this developmentally maybe, because in that interview prior to going on stage, which is available online, I did try to get to him to say, look, self-authorship is not the end of the story. Um, he actually has a company, called, or it's maybe he did, I'm not sure if he still does, about self-authorship, uh, a kind of consultancy arm training people to be self-authored. And by that he means don't simulate thinking based on what's in the social surround. Don't just pick up sound bites and narratives and stories and pass it off as thought. Figure out for yourself what's really going on and build your identity around that. And, you know, there's a case for that. But developmentally, there's a long way to go. There's a lot of other ways of looking at things. And when it comes to the truth, 
you know, you can get to the truth with your own kind of ideological frame, your own epistemic frame. And I think Peterson did, did that. But his frame is quite, uh, it's grounded in the individual. It's, it's, it's fundamentally a psychological frame. Um, it's uh, quite Manichaean in spirit. It's sort of binaries, a world of polarities, not kind of dualities that sort of interpenetrate, but something more like either this or that, man or woman, masculine or feminine, good or bad, you know, this kind of thing. Um, and from that perspective, he could see a lot and he can explain a lot and he can tell beautiful stories and captivate people for hours. But what he didn't do very often is critique his own model of the world. He didn't very often come back and say, you know, this thing about order and chaos, I wonder where that came from exactly. You know, what kind of mental model was I using to make that binary? And, uh, if, or does he say something like, you know, I wonder what an anthropologist would say about this. Or if, if a sociologist would hear, how would they critique what I just said? You never hear him say that kind of thing. He's not that interested in sort of epistemic plurality. He was quite interested in building a model of the world based on the axioms he had, which were powerful axioms. But it's like one of these sort of cartoon stories where the, you know, the, there's a certain power, but it's also limited. And so when it comes to the whole truth, what I mean is, very often you'll say something like, you know, he'll give a generic praise of capitalism. Capitalism's made us all so prosperous and, you know, life expectancy is getting better, la la you will say, yeah, but it's also deeply problematic. So much unemployment, people are dying young, it's getting worse, ecological impact. And I think, to his credit, you know, in a less heated environment, as a thoughtful, intelligent person, he can follow all of that. There's no intellectual limit in that sense. But there is a kind of ideological, cultural limit in that he's forced to play this position of having this view of the world and then doubling down on any, any attack on it is by definition a threat rather than something that he might learn from. That was what I began to notice. Um, so the emphasis on truth that he makes, the, the, the whole truth is actually a bit of a threat to truth as a kind of lo lodestar or touchstone, because what the whole truth does is, it says, yes, you're right to look for the truth, but don't expect it to be sort of absolute and final. It will be a process of revision. It will have multiple perspectives. It will be contested. And it's difficult to build a movement around that, you know? So. Uh, when he's speaking to his mainstream audience, and by that I mean the, the people who most identify with him as a kind of father figure who can tell them how to live, you know, tentative truth not going to cut it, right? He wants something firmer, rules for life. And that's where I, some people lose a bit of interest, because they can see that those, those rules are not really rules. They're kind of guidelines based on a view, one particular view of the world. So. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I would frame... I have framed Peterson in the past as the last gasp of the heroic individual. Like I think he kind of articulated that, and, and I think he, it is true, like that, that, that story of the individual, the, the kind of the sacred individual that's contained within the Judean and Christian right. story is absolutely true. And it's very, very, it's a very big story. Yeah. And I also would say that what was compelling about him was this focus on truth and this focus on the Logos as articulated truth. And I think the other compelling thing about him was that he, he was congruent with that message. There was the sense yeah. of spoken truth articulated through what he was saying in a really organic way. It's interesting, like personally, my attention span has just completely gone with the like, number of notifications we get, kind of the hijacking of social media. The other day, one of his Maps of Meaning lectures came on after another YouTube film I was watching. And I watched, and I'd seen it before, but I still had to turn it off to go to bed after about an hour. Right. Like I was still compelled because there was something about the way he was talking in those Maps of Meaning lectures that is kind of like, he knows the territory, but he's, but he's following a thread of inquiry, yeah. uh, of kind of genuine, curious inquiry right. into, and there's an aliveness that I think, I think he started to lose more and more and more as he became as, as the story became well known, especially when he sort of went around the world telling essentially very similar stories yeah, yeah, yeah. night in, night out. And that sense of novelty, which is something we've talked about a lot on Rebel Wisdom as well, is like there was this sense of novelty in a lot of the conversations that he was having and maybe a lot of the conversations in this kind of intellectual dark web space were having in 2018, mm -hmm. that then, like, I don't know where the novelty is now. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, 
I think we're sort of wanting to find, okay, where is the novelty? Maybe it's in the people who, um, maybe it's in the Schmachtenbergers of this world. Maybe it's in the kind of, um, some of the, the other people who are now bubbling under right. after this kind of epistemic thunderstorm has, right. has passed. Yeah. Well, I mean, a few things came to mind there. One was um, a lovely line by Carl Rogers, the psychotherapist. He said, what is most personal is most universal. And I think that's the key to understanding Peterson's appeal is he's deeply personal. He'll speak about his own troubles and travails and how much anguish he goes through, his own you know, depressive thoughts, his darkness. He, he really intensely feels these things and people can identify and, and, and with them. And a them. perfect YouTube star. Like the paradox of being like not a digital native, but YouTube and internet is all about letting people into your life, letting people see your family, letting people see your struggles. Right. Like he was transparent in that way. Yeah. And yet he had this sort of backup of having taught at Harvard and being a you know, tenured professor and clinical psychologist and having written books. So people gave him a lot of benefit of the doubt. And as time went on and he spoke less and more and more about things he didn't know so well and less and less about things he did, uh, he became a different kind of person, I suppose. Um, but in terms of where things are now, I mean, um, that kind of, the, the, the most interesting moment for me is the interview I had with him that I also talk about in the paper, is I was saying to him, look, you seem to be saying there's something sacred about the individual. And he responded very pointedly and he said, it's not that there's something sacred about it. That's it. That is the sacred thing. Um, and that is, as you say, Judeo-Christian mythology or mythos even, that says the heart of life is something about the sanctity of the individual, that somehow we're a reflection of you know, the, the divine in some way, and that this is it. To, to know yourself as an individual in God's image is somehow it, right? That's the answer. But curiously, Peterson himself falls some way short of being Christian, right? He's not, you know, there's a kind of ambiguity there. My colleague Ian Christie put it beautifully when he said that Peterson is sort of suspended between Christ and Nietzsche because he, like Nietzsche, he wants away from the herd morality. He wants people to find their own way, forge their own path. Um, but he won't go all the way to the nihilism. He won't go into this kind of, and therefore we make everything up. There is no fundamental meaning or whatever. Um, but he's not, with Christ, he's kind of like, yes, logos incarnate, but he's not willing to go to charity and community and communion, um, which is what, where that leads. So he's sort of in this awkward place between them. Um, but it's still, that place is quite an uh, intriguing spectacle. You know, for those who sort of know those intellectual traditions, he's really struggling to land. So that's why one of the reasons he's so entrancing for people, because uh, it's as if he's trying to land somewhere but can't, because he hasn't resolved those kind of tensions. Yeah. So the interview with, with Peterson, I think, grabbed me at the time and still grabs me, sort of makes the hairs on the back of my neck stand up, was in the transliminal interview when he talked about he was actually being asked whether he believed in God and he kind of said I don't like answering that question it puts me on one side of a binary and I don't think people understand what they mean when they ask that question but he said something like if you get yourself together then we don't know the limitations of that we don't know the limitations of, of, of us if we really get ourselves together and if we really get ourselves together who knows what happens like what transformations might be possible in the world and like and he said, oh, I've had intimations of that. I've had intimations of what that might mean. Mm. It's kind of interesting, like that whole trajectory that happened to him after that. Like, was that that feeling of sort of synchronicity of, of, of a similar process to that? But I feel that I've had similar experiences, like that sense of, and I'm sure many, many people have, like the sense of when you just, you get into a real state of flow, things start to work, synchronicities start to happen. Okay. You start to feel like there's more to life than... The, the kind of materialist framework would, would, would make you think there is, and this sense of tapping into something greater. Um, like that for me is like the core of what Jordan Peterson was at least meant to me when I, when I was, and I kind of forgive him an awful lot just for bringing that into the, right. into the cultural conversation. So he did, the question is whether it's still there, right? So this is three and a half years later. That's why I was excited too, right? I I'd created this new organization with Thomas Bjorkman, ostensibly about bringing spiritual and psychological matters to bear more profoundly on questions of socio-economical and, and politic, political matters. And so he comes along and people are paying a lot of attention. We think, great, like, this is it. Someone else is seeing it and people are responding. And okay, maybe this is happening. Um, but what he was saying was quite particular, right? I mean, 
yes, there are moments like the moments, particular answers he gives in particular places that are luminous and helpful. And for what it's worth, I was never really an atheist. I mean, not clear what I am, but it never really it seemed pretty obvious to me that the question was what the nature of God was rather than whether there was something there. Um, and I still haven't really figured that out. But I know that with Peterson, it sounded a lot like he was speaking of a sort of monotheistic God. Um, and in the conversation he had with Ian McGilchrist, they have this toing and froing about being and becoming. And I think for McGilchrist, God is more of a becoming, and for Peterson, it's more of a being. But then he doesn't really want to say he believes in God for the reasons you mentioned. Um, so yeah, I don't know. I, I think bringing that into the conversation is is a good point. Like, did that happen? In what way did it happen? Because that was what excited me too. It was like, look, people, you know, stop talking about marginal tax rates. Stop talking about GDP. Stop banging on about the, change, the slight tweak in education policy and the latest figures of which country is getting better mass results than the other. Let's speak about the meaning and purpose of life, right? Here's a guy who's doing it and people seem to love it. There's an appetite for this, an audience, go and look. That's what was driving me to say to people, Peterson has something to say. Um, and at that level, I'm totally with him. You know, raising the tenor, raising the mattering, the sense of significance that life is precious and you need to focus on what it means for you and for everyone else. He did that brilliantly. Um, it's just a question of once you get into the details then of what it means for men and women and what it means for getting a job. And that, then it gets a bit more murky and he's not such a great guide maybe. Um, but I, I agree with you that I'm grateful that those questions were raised. I just not, I'm just not sure how much they've stayed with us. Mm. Um, or how much they've progressed. Progressed, but when people like who are not that interested in Peterson, who've maybe, you know, I don't know how many hours you've spent, probably more than me, but those who haven't spent more than say 20 hours reading or thinking about Peterson, uh, and I could probably add a zero to that and you could probably add two, but the, you know, those people, they, they've got some take on him. The take was something to do with maybe young men, something to do with the way he spoke, something to do with women, the Kathy Newman. There's a few little bits and pieces, but I'm not sure they've brought this, oh yeah, we should talk about the Logos. You know, I don't think that's really come through. And, and the way I end my paper, where I really try and, you know, look for the good in what he's offering and what was overlooked by people who were criticizing him, as you know. But I do end up in this position of disappointment, actually. And, and the disappointment was something like, you have the audience, you have the intellect, you have the curiosity, you seem to have the goodwill even for a more viable civilization. And you have the capacity to understand opposing points of view. But you don't seem to be that interested in finding that larger whole of truth. Um, instead, there's a kind of doubling down on this way rather than that way. Um, and uh, that, that saddened me a bit. I think there was a chance there. But on the other hand, expecting too much of one person, right? Because the human side of this, yeah. the human side of this is just a guy, like any other guy, like you or me or anyone else, thrown into the world. Um, and yeah, there is a kind of Christian, you know, backdrop to it because there was a kind of sacrifice. Yeah. Uh, and then there is maybe a kind of resurrection going on as well. Um, but obviously, what you know, it sounds ridiculous to say that because, of course, he's just a guy. Yeah, so, and, yeah. Th and this is the other question that comes up, which is, and I know this will be, this is felt very strongly by um, people who are fans of Peterson, is like, leave him alone, don't criticise him. And the, the question is, like, certainly um, I'm asking the question, like, how much did I have personally invested in him as a person? And is that entirely fair? Is that, is that fair? And also the questions that we're asking, are we asking um, for us to learn the lessons and for all, all of us collectively to move on from right. what Jordan provided? And I think what Jordan provided was absolutely of huge importance right. and huge value. Is it right to, to think that he's the one who needs to kind of take this thinking on or is it, is it up to us no. to take it on? Yeah, I, um, I mean, well, I mean, my response to that is, um, and I mean us, not us. Yeah, I, I know, I know, I know, I mean the, world, kind of the world as a whole. Everybody else. Yeah. But I think, um, so it's worth just pausing and think about what exactly we're talking about here, because it's not obvious to everyone, but as you painted it, the world in 2017, 2018, um, for many people, there was this sense of sort of 
stasis and decay and a kind of failure to reckon with what was going on, an inability to deal with the most fundamental problems of our time, the kind of rise of surveillance capitalism on the one hand of government not really playing an adequate role, failure to deal with the climate crisis maybe, um, increasing political polarization, um, a sense that things were slowly but surely falling apart, even if there was also a countervailing story that said things are better than ever, look at the data, life expectancy, economic growth and so forth. But as Daniel Schmachtenberger puts it very elegantly, when one part of a complex system is, is apparently doing well and another is apparently doing very badly, it doesn't mean the truth is some kind of balance in between. It means an inherent instability. Um, and that was the context in which it's like we need new narratives and new sense of who we are as human beings and a new sense of meaning and purpose in life. Now, I don't think Peterson himself actually brought that, by the way, because if, for those who know, like, I don't know, René Girard or William Irwin Thompson or uh, James Hillman, maybe, it wasn't radically new material. It was sort of Peterson's own take on a lot of things other people had said. What was different was the tenor, it was the mattering, it was the intensity of, guys, let's, sort, you know, let's really live fully, let's figure this out. And he did it in his own somewhat, you know, perhaps limited, perhaps distorted, but nonetheless captivating way, in a way that was compelling and in, even inspiring. It's like, you know, a lot of people were like, whatever that guy's on, you know, it's, it's interesting to watch because he clearly is living at a high degree of intensity. But what you don't see on the cameras, of course, is the behind the scenes, the, the collapses, the, the fallout. Um, so it's, it's, yeah, it's a, it's a difficult one to, to read. But the sense of disappointment, though, is it's not so much with Peterson for me. I mean, I know that there's a little bit of that. For me, it's more like the lack of curiosity about him amongst my peer group or my professional colleagues. Uh, it's like, aren't you, aren't you a bit curious to know why millions of people seem to think he's so impressive? And they're not, and it, it bothers me. It's like, that's weird, you know? Yeah. I mean, one of the other paradoxes that I would be interested to tease out, we haven't come to the developmental thing yet, but he was very uh, critical of the new atheist mm. worldview. Mm. And this is something that we've talked about, we've written about, like, the deeper conception of what we are as human beings and this limiting conception of sort of just the rationalist, just the materialist. But this is the paradox as well of the sort of partial truth. And I think he, he applied that to the individual really, really well. But what I like the yes and is like, what does a society look like if you build it around a conception of a human being that is so limited? And the, the other paradox is that in some ways, I think he part of his sort of um, downfall with the with the benzodiazepines was a medical system that doesn't know how to treat that that over prescribes for example a medical system that has very little conception of like the vagaries of the human psyche yeah. therefore treats everything with with drugs um that like the corruption of the system under this kind of very narrow conception of of, of people but also this it was the yes and like he had a, a lot to say about the positives of Western culture, which is which is true, like hierarchies yeah. of competence, the amazing kind of thing that we that has been created around um, these values of, of Western culture. But at the same time, this sense many of us have of like it's becoming increasingly hollowed out, yeah. being increasingly exploited by greed. It's being increasingly exploited by a very predatory form of. Yeah. Um, it's not capitalism. It's a it's a certain cancer within capitalism that allows you to strip out all the value from organizations it's the fact that as the wire showed like the wire i think is the perfect kind of meditation on the death of america right. if you start measuring everything but valuing nothing you get people meeting the stats like the police force just busting people on street corners rather than doing actual police work you get teachers that are being tested all the time so they learn to meet the test rather than doing the actual education yeah. like all of this kind of hollowing out and corruption of a system, which I think is implicitly tied to a very narrow conception of what human beings are, an attempt to measure and quantify all of those things. And that was a yes and that for me was a, a huge paradox at the heart of Peterson's thinking, is that he talked about the value of Western culture. In a, I can understand that because it's being denigrated by a lot of the people that he's, that he's kind of in conflict with, like the kind of postmodern neo-Marxists, yeah, yeah. etc. This was, this was also a massive paradox within 
what became known as the intellectual dark web, because I think you had someone like Eric Weinstein and Brett Weinstein who were much more focused on the hollowing out of the system and the fact that, especially since the 70s, we've had increasingly hollowed out institutions. Ironically, some of the postmodern thinkers like Baudrillard talked about this, that you have institutions that become a simulation of themselves as they go on. And this, for me, was a huge paradox of, of that. It's like, yes, he was pointing at this, and in a way, I think if, if he was able to have done this kind of yes and with that, that would have then opened him out to people more of a left wing sort of disposition who are more focused on the faults of the institutions, the faults of the, um, what do you think, do you, like that for me was just this central paradox in his thinking because I think he was very easily painted as He's just an apologist for the current system. Yeah, 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 sure. Whereas I think implicit in some of his philosophies yeah, yeah. was was a more holistic view yeah. or a more complete view than that. Quite possibly. I mean, it's hard to say, but there's a few things that came to mind there. One is just at a human level, you know, uh, while he did shoot to fame and did very well, you know, I believe there was then a lot of family, you know, crisis and tragedy that you know that compounded an existing mental health vulnerability. And, you know, at a personal level, I wish him well. Like, you know, I don't, I, having met the guy, like any other human being, you don't want unnecessary suffering. And it's, it has been good to see him convalesce in that sense. So that's just the first thing to say. The second is that uh, where I began to appreciate uh, Peterson again after going through that writing process was when his forward to the Gulag Archipelago came out, the Solzhenitsyn classic text. And what I realized there that I already, I think I already knew to some extent, is that Peterson's saying something that we maybe don't hear enough of, which is that civilization is a fragile achievement. Like, we're not that far from chaos and anarchy. And he feels that more intensely than most. We kind of take it for granted. You know, stable governments, functional markets, uh, schools to go to, healthcare available, shops to buy food from. It works, but as we saw with COVID, it's not that stable, right? It can collapse within a few days or weeks if a few things go wrong in a few different places because it's so thoroughly interdependent and um, we're ultimately biological organisms and we're all vulnerable. And, you know, you, you're not, we, we were moments during COVID where we maybe felt that pressure, like there are no riots on the streets, but, you know, who's to say there won't be if this lockdown carries on for another month or so. So to his credit, Peterson's message about, look, things could be so much worse. They really could be so much worse. And you've no idea how lucky you are, as to put it in Peterson tenor. And he's, I sort of think that's a valuable point not to lose sight of. And it's probably maybe one of Peterson's better and more important points. Just be grateful for the functional civilization and don't, don't lightly mess with it, right? By all means, improve it or try to. But don't sort of casually tinker with it because it's a profound and precious achievement. That's the first thing. Um, but yeah, coming back to the issue of, of yes and, um, and what could be done, I do think there's a little bit of a comedian-like quality with Peterson too. He responds to what he's part of. So I think the, the thinker in him, the reflective, you know, able, the highly able thinker in him, put him in a room with other intelligent people talking about different aspects of the world's problems. And he'll be very receptive, I suspect. And, you know, you'll find in him Yes, he'll make more sophisticated judgments about society and the economy, but he was never really meant to be an expert on those things. You know, it was just that he was propelled, the combination of life advice and psychological background, and then the culture war dimension, meant that people thought he had answers to everything. And maybe the single best insight of the last few months since his new book came out was in a review by Oliver Berkman, um, where Oliver makes the really astute point that a lot of people don't understand something about Peterson because the way Oliver puts it, there's two main kinds of suffering, right? There's sort of existential human suffering, which is suffering about the nature of being human. The fact that you get ill, the fact that you struggle for meaning, the fact that you will die, that you have relationships that are painful, that there's anguish. These are just inherent existential phenomena. And there's a lot of suffering in that, what Peterson would call the challenges of being or bearing the burden of be being, as he put it. And he's right about that, right? But that's more of a concern for people broadly on what's conventionally known as the political right, right. I don't like the political spectrum, it's not a conversation, but for what it's worth, those who refer to the right see those problems and they think they're really important. Those on the left, as it's described, tend to be more interested in sort of 
problems of the current predicament, uh, whether you can get a job, how good your education is, um, whether you're paying enough for healthcare or not, and suffering arising from people who don't have opportunities. So if Peterson says, you know, grow the hell up and sort yourself out, and you're saying, well, I've got to look after my sick mum, I'm living on minimum wage, I've just lost that job, how do you propose I do that? You know, they're like, what about that? And Peterson wouldn't say that's not real. It's just that it's not really what he's talking about. What he's talking about is not the, suffer the socioeconomic causes of suffering. He's speaking about the existential and psychological causes of suffering. And there's a lot of miscommunication based on a failure to see that. And a lot of the critiques of him are like, well, what about this stuff? And he's like, yeah, it's there, but it's not really my terrain. My terrain is bearing the burden of being, right? That's how he, I think that's how he sees it. Um, and that's why there's so much confusion around him. Because he's speaking of one form of suffering that some people think is the heart of the matter. And the others are say, not seeing him saying anything about the form of suffering that they see as the heart of the matter. So we also interviewed Ken Wilbur on Rebel Wisdom um, about Jordan Peterson, about the intellectual dark web. And I'd still direct people towards the, the Ken Wilbur piece, Trump in a post-truth world, which I think gives so that he uses the spiral dynamics map. And spiral dynamics is about kind of different value systems being online at the same time. And a lot of what we're seeing in the culture war is clashes between those different value systems. And why, like I think this is incredibly useful for making sense of what's going on. I think it's essential to make sense of both the Peterson phenomenon and the intellectual dark web phenomenon, and for me, where it went off the rails. Because if you look at what Wilbur and Spiral Dynamics calls green. Green is postmodernism. It's challenging dominant narratives and bringing in different perspectives. But when it goes off the rails, it becomes relativistic. It becomes the, par the performative paradox of saying, there is no truth, but that's a truth. And why I find that incredibly useful is that you can see that a lot of the, the pointing out the, the um, inherent contradictions and um, warped, um, the warped nature of green can be, can be just done from a sort of reactive perspective. Or what Spiral Dynamics does is it posits that there's a perspective, there's a point beyond these value systems where you see that they're all necessary, that they all have partial truths that then can, that they confuse themselves with the whole truth. And that, I think, is an incredibly, you, then you can see what is a kind of purely reactive rejection and what is sort of saying, okay, we can see a partial truth here and we can see an integrated perspective beyond it. And that, for me, is like the central question. It's like, what of postmodernism is useful? What is not useful? Where does it go too far? What is the yes and perspective? And, I, I mean, you know a lot more about kind of developmental theories, developmental thinkers than I do. How would you frame it within the context of making sense of the Peterson phenomenon? Gosh, it's a big question. Um, so, so we can play with spiral dynamics. I mean, it, it, I think from a, from a sort of intellectual academic perspective, spiral dynamics is considered quite a crude tool, but it, in some ways it's a good ga gateway drug, if you like. It's a kind of, uh, as long as you realize it's, it's, it's a map of something with, with lots of assumptions baked into it that may not be entirely valid. Um, well, it's certainly true that Peterson was responding and reacting to what you call green. And by that, you, it's not so much postmodernism as a whole, but a certain wave of postmodernism. Some have called it a third wave of postmodernism, which is identitarian in nature. And it's, it takes sort of perspective or standpoint theory to a, a sort of absolutist extent such that you can only speak to an issue with authority if you embody that yourself. So a white person shouldn't speak about the challenge of being a black person, for example. Um, which of course is not, the whole, not, you know, may have something in it, but it's not the whole truth and it, it shouldn't be that strongly expressed. Um, and that writ large is everything from, uh, you know, feeling that everything is seen through that lens of cultural war in which it's all about what your identity is, um, what your race is, what your gender is, what your age is, whether or not you're able-bodied, what your sexuality is, and so forth, that those are the primary features of reality and that we have to see everything through that prism. That's only one strain of one aspect of postmodernism, to be clear. 
But when Peterson spoke of postmodernism, he was very often speaking of that, and he was linking it almost at the same time to a, a particular view of Marxism, what he called cultural Marxism, um, which was a kind of collective gone mad, you know, um, in which it's a, the individual giving way to the collective will was always and every time a disaster leading to the gulag, right? It was totally overplayed. But the way Peterson saw it, I think, is there's an inbuilt dynamic that once you surrender certain individual rights to the collective, the collective has a kind of will of its own and the, an underlying logic of its own that takes over oppressively. So when he would say things that were a little bit absurd, like equity, liberty, and uh, whichever third... Equity, you know, equality, and diversity. That's right, sorry, yes. Yeah, so equity, equity, equality, and diversity. Are we sure about that? I'm not sure. Well, it's still. diversity, equity, uh, diversity, inclusion, and equity. That, D, it's D-I-E. Okay, is the... I think it was probably those three, yeah. yeah. But I remember um, at one point he, he attacked these three things as being somehow evil and that they inherently led to this mob rule collective in which the individual was squashed. And that was never really the case. Like, that's something to do with Peterson's own psychodrama. It's not built into postmodernism. It's not a developmental phenomenon. What is true is that there's a shadow to this kind of what's sometimes called green worldview. And the shadow is a sort of inability to properly grapple with power, an inability to see your own framing of the world as somehow constructed and limited, um, an inability to appreciate the validity of prior worldviews. So um, that's why a lot of people who, who have something like a green cultural code um, struggle to appreciate maybe the conservative philosophical tradition, for example, uh, or they'll struggle to appreciate um, the the stockbroker who really wants to make a success and make a lot of money. They'll just typically see that as an entirely bad thing. Now, these are broad brush generalizations. But insofar as that's the kind of framework, there are a few other things to add in here. The other is that there are so many developmental models, right? The spiral dynamics that you've mentioned is principally about cultural code. Uh, it's about the sort of organizing cultural dynamic of groups of people that individuals have to some extent. But once you get into the theory, how it's held by the individual and how it manifests as the group are quite distinct things. You can't really map them onto each other. What does it mean in the context of Peterson? I feel the more interesting thing about Peterson is to figure out the way in which he was captured by his own developmental limitation. Now, it feels audacious for me to say that. Like, I have my own limitations. Of course, we all do. Uh, I can't see what I can't see about how I'm viewing the world. What I felt with Peterson is that he was actually hiding in plain sight because he kept speaking about ideology and the problem of ideology and how ideology, how, you know, his, his, his genesis as a thinker was how on earth could the world destroy itself through the Cold War based on ideology. That's what got him thinking about maps of meaning and archetypes and so forth. And he grew up in the Cold War as, as we did. Um, but ideology is precise. He was ideological. You know, he is ideological because this view of the world that he has which is a sort of fun, a fairly fundamentalist, individualist view that the individual is sacred, the collective is a threat, um, and that we have to organize society in such a way that we keep the collective at bay and honor the individual. Um, it's too extreme a view. In fact, what we need today, I think, developmentally, at a cultural level and an individual level, is something about the co-constitution of the individual and the collective, in which the individual doesn't arrive. There is no such thing really as the individual. I mean, you, you can take a Buddhist view on that or any kind of process philosophy view. The individual is totally constructed by its surrounds and its history and its genetics and a million other factors. Totally? Um, well, good point. Not totally. Lo um, That's where I would... Significantly, mm. let's see. Significantly. But it, it, what you get to, though, is a position where a lot of the things we say about the individual being sacred remain true. The, the construction of the individual through all of these biopsychosocial processes, it doesn't make the individual less real or fundamental or sacred even. But it's just important to see that those things are there. So what you want in the end is not individual or collective. It's not the Manichaean binary. It's something more like collective individuation. It's like, yes, become who you are. Yes, find your own individual way in life. And there is something sacred about that. But do it in the context of the collective that defines you and that you're responding to and serving, right? And you never really heard that from Peterson, this notion of service or charity. It, it was more about getting on in life and, and sometimes even the domination view of 
becoming top lobster, as people joked. It wasn't, it was less about finding a form, you know, like Bill Doong that you've covered in some of your other programs. You know, learn to become what you have to be to give back to society as you find it in this historical moment. So whether that's climate crisis or dealing with AI coming downstream or whatever it may be for you, grow in such a way that you can deal with that. Um, so developmentally for me, there was something interesting about the cultural response, about those who couldn't see the partial validity of some of the things he was saying. And Peterson himself may be overreacting to one version of it, seeing a greater threat than was really there. But there's also an issue of how he constructed his whole worldview, having its own kind of developmental uh, limitations. And then that's seen through my developmental limitations, but that's, that's the way it goes. Yeah, I think there's a paradox. There's something very paradoxical that, about that dynamic between the individual and the collective. Because I've heard that argument, I think, about individuals, I think it's it's common That's, within yeah. it's common within sort of meta modern mm -hmm. thinking that the individual is kind of an illusion because it's and I I think that's wrong. I think it's obviously true that the individual is contingent to some degree on kind of our relationships, our upbringings, all that stuff. But there is the paradox for me is resolved. Like we have to go through the individual individuum in the individuation process, like the the kind of the Jungian process of doing our own work. And I think part of the paradox is that I think a lot of people try and jump to the collective before they've done the, the work. Right. Like, and this comes from a very, very instinctive place of having done various forms of personal growth work, of spiritual practice. And there is a felt sense for me of when you tap into that place that is kind of almost beyond the individual, mm -hmm. like the, this mm -hmm. sort of timeless, transcendental aspect, maybe, yeah. that feels like, and then you, if you do that work with others who are also doing that work, you get a felt sense of meeting the same person. Right. In some ways, like you recognize yourself in the other in yes. a very felt sense way, in a very kind of like, like in a way beyond the individual, there is a feeling of a collective consciousness or a collective experience of meeting yeah. oneself again, but you can't bypass the work of, of, of real accountability, of real, truth speaking, of real shadow work, of real kind of deep inner inquiry before you get to that place. Right. That so for the, me is like the paradox no, of I, where I, it's well, resolved. I, I think it's more or less, I agree. I mean, um, there's a lovely folk, folk line about that, which is you have to be somebody before you can be nobody. Mm. Um, and of course, people think being nobody is always entirely a bad thing, but in certain spiritual traditions, it's precisely to get beyond the illusion of the self. But equally, those people who achieve becoming nobody, as it were, um, you know, certain advanced Buddhist practitioners, they have radiant personalities too. You know, they'll, they'll, they're not, they don't disappear into the ether or, you know, blend in the collective. They're actually individuated and you, you, you long to be in their presence for that reason because they actually, they are an individual. And they've become somebody, but there's a sense in which they've seen through it as well. So it, it's both of these things at once. And one thing to add there is that this is quite a fundamental background tension in a lot of the discussions about the spiritual in general because there's and, and Zach Stein speaks to this better than I can but there's there's a kind of quality of soul work that's really about something about your unique role in the world the, you know um, finding your, the unique self that you're meant to be and are and can become in response to your historical challenges but there's also this kind of transcendent quality of seeing through the self, seeing beyond the self, realizing that it's kind of an illusion. And you don't have to choose, you know, it's not as though it's either one or the other. It, they're sort of part of the same, what Zach would call metapsychology, but they're, they're, they're sort of a view of what the human's going through that don't contradict each other. They don't cancel each other out, but they're just different kinds of work. Um, what, and one is kind of about being somebody and the other is about being nobody in a good way. Um, and you can be both. Um, I think the, yeah, so. And, and that for me is the paradox of the, the kind of, the Buddhists talk about the sort of waking up to your true nature and that sort of timeless thing that, um, that timeless essence within you. But I think there's a kind of Western form of that, which I actually ironically talked to Peterson about when I saw him in, um, in Toronto. And he talked about Jung's idea of the four dimensional self. And what I understood from that was the four dimensional self is that is that your potentiality is calling to you through your interests. Mm -hmm. And I, I've always felt like I've had these moments of kind of like 
awakening of like, not only do I have a sense of kind of that, that inner spirit, but also, or that inner essence, but I also have a sense of like, everything that I've done up to this point has given me exactly the tools and exactly the experiences to do what I need to do next, which is, an, it's like, it's an awe inspiring feeling to have. It's like, even that thing that I did that made no sense at the tool, at the time has given me this this tool now which is what i what i feel is like my particular burden to carry my responsibility to take on and yeah we talked about this and he talked about yeah that's jung's idea of the four dimensional self um and that that par that's kind of a, a paradox it's kind of a western form of awakening that i don't hear many people talking about well there there are sources um and I, i'm slightly on the edge of my competence here but i i, I can say that when i was coming to the end of uh, the Moves That Matter, my book about what Chess taught me about life. And I was trying to get to some kind of spiritual endpoint, a bit like this. And initially it was something to do with seeing through the self and seeing this personal story I'd gone through as somehow something that I'd transcended. But actually, then I began looking into some of this unique self theory, which is a bit more sort of uh, Judeo-Christian, particularly Jewish, um, or even Kabbalah kind of theory. Um, and that it's sort of the purpose of life is to find out who you are as an individual, as a unique, precious being, is also valid, right? And so I was sort of grappling, because they both seem true to me. Um, and Perspectiva's title, you know, Systems, Souls and Society, we are, you know, we are, we are sort of, premise, you know, there is a premise of the soul, that the soul is something real and valid and worth, worth investing in. Um, but there's also the spirit, which is something maybe a little different. Um, and there I would just refer viewers to Zach Stein's work because he, he knows it better than I do. It's wonderful to see that he's back, that he's well enough to be engaging in conversations again. And what I would personally love to see would be, because I feel like we look back at that sort of tr initial trajectory and I think partly it was because of the, the nature of the confrontational media coverage, mm -hmm. but also I think something temperamental in him that made many of his conversations into a kind of mano a mano yeah. kind of individualist kind of maybe slightly kind of top lobster yeah uh, it's a battle of interaction like, yeah. um could there be now more of a sort of dialogue more of a kind of emergent right. um yeah it's more of a dialogue more of a so i'm not sure so i i there was a moment um as i mentioned in that interview with him where I spoke about his lack of sociological imagination um, and I thought to myself for a while what if Peterson after this first book tour were to spend because he because he reads text so intensely and got in such great depth with all of the psychology he's done what if he was to spend two years at some university institute studying sociology or economics or anthropology or you know social sciences away from the just the psyche and then come back and tell us about how this broader integrative pattern was there. I would have been intrigued to see that, but then to be honest, I don't think it could have happened. I don't, I don't know if even before the illness and the, the reaction and the, you know, the, everything that happened to him, I'm not sure he wanted to do that. I don't, I don't know what his epistemic appetite, um, it's deep, but I don't think it's very broad. And I think that's a problem. I think that means there's a limit to what he can tell us. He can certainly go deep into the psyche and he can tell us interesting mythological stories and what they might mean. But in, you mentioned Wilbur earlier, you know, in Wilbur's classic quadrant map of the different parts of reality, things about social structure and, and ecological systems, I don't know if he's ever going to say anything particularly profound about them, nor is he going to show that much attention to them. So a dialogue with him, I mean, I must admit, although at a personal level, yes, it's good to see someone recover and I know also that millions of people literally uh, really cared about him and really think that he helped them and you know their lives would have been destroyed had it not been for encountering his work. So that's not minor. You know he really did help a lot of people. Um, but speaking personally in terms of my relationship to his work, after I'd written that piece, which took me almost six months to write, I noticed. Uh, there wasn't that much appetite anymore to go back there. And, and his new book that's come out, you know, I'm not saying I'll never read it, but I, I noticed that I'm not, I'm not reaching for it. I'm not, I'm not that intrigued. I sort of felt as though I exhausted whatever that energy was that you mentioned. There was a feeling of coming out the other side of it. Um, 
which is not to say that it won't be good or that others shouldn't read it, just that it's interesting for me to notice that I feel as though I've done my time with Peterson. Um, curious to see what happens next, but, but probably not to be very involved in it. Maybe one other thing to reflect on is the thing that I think a lot of people really connected with, with Jordan Peterson was the intense practicality of his work. I mean, it was incredibly intellectual, it kind of drew on myth, it drew on all these kind of different kind of um, evolutionary, psych evolutionary psychology or evolutionary biology, but it, essentially it, it boiled it down to something very, very practical. Clean your room, do something, um, which is like very, it's very rare for academics to, to break out in the way that he did. And, there, there's, and obviously a lot of people got a huge amount from that, like people genuinely feel like he saved their lives, yeah. that he gave them purpose. Yeah. How, are there any lessons there in terms of you are, are you an academic or you're certainly kind of involved kind of, in? Academic in, in denial. Or you're a philosopher. Yes, you're a philosopher. Say, yeah, yeah. Um, what lessons are there for you? What lessons are there for anyone in, in that? kind of like coming out of the ivory tower and, and having an impact on the world? Well, um, it, it, there's, good, there's lessons for good and bad, right? Because on the one hand, peop, what exactly was it that people were responding to? Um, do people want to be told what to do? Is that, is that part of it? And if so, is that problematic in some way or is that something that we should offer? Um, you know, there's that joke about giving me a one-armed economist because they always say on the one hand, on the other hand. Um, and I think that what, people, what troubles people about academia is that what academics are trained to do is to problematize things and to show nuance. And you get on in your career by the degree to which you can finesse everything. And Peterson could do that in, in his own domain, uh, although he was often very, you know, more dogmatic and absolutist on things he maybe didn't understand so well. But people responded to the, I think, therefore, you should do this. And in that case, clearly, you should do this. You know, go and repair your relationships, tidy your room, um, buck up, you know, don't give up, you know. But this is kind of banal folk advice, right? And you might say, well, it's not that banal. Some people maybe haven't heard it. Some, maybe we take it for granted. Maybe there's a whole generation who, who actually, for whatever reason, hasn't really experienced that kind of direction and are craving it. Uh, and that's possible. And maybe Peterson met that need. Is there a broader lesson for those who are in the world of ideas and uh, intellectuals or academics? Um, I think it's more about how he spoke. I don't think it's that he gave nuggets of advice. I think it's that they could feel the visceral caring and mattering. When they listened to Peterson, they felt their life was on the line because Peterson speaks as if it is. So if there's a, a message, it's about the beauty of powerful rhetoric. And, and, and getting into that. Because most academics are, are worried about what other people will think. And they'll finesse everything so much so that you lose the train of thought. Not the best ones, of course, but if there's a lesson, it's like how you say things matters almost as much as what you say, if not more so, actually. And, and as we've said a few times, you're interested in a lot of the same topics. You're interested in the meaning crisis. You're interested in a lot of the um, the same issues that Jordan Peterson was bringing attention to, but maybe dealing with them, addressing them in a slightly different way. Yeah. Perspectiva, we mentioned. Um, be interested to hear, like, what have you got coming up? What has Perspectiva got coming up? Okay, great. So we have a few different things. Uh, we have five books coming out. We've become a small publisher. Um, one of them is actually about metamodernism, which is about beyond postmodernism. So in terms of the Peterson debate, that's there. One of them is about activism, the, you know, getting beyond that, getting, getting inside activism, what it's like to be an activist, uh, but in a more sophisticated, psychologically informed way. Um, we also have about something about the politics of waking up. And we have a piece about uh, shadows of the enlightenment. And we have something about unlearning. So these are all broadly in Peterson kind of orbit. Um, then we have something very relevant to the whole issue of the tenor of public debate, something called the anti-debate. We've just uh, we've raised funds for a two-year project to develop a new practice of what we call about epistemic humility. How do you engage in a conversation with a view to kind of you know learning from debate in terms of its spectacle quality, its excitement, its sense of mattering, but also dialogue, really trying to understand the other person, understanding yourself better. And you win not by beating the other side, but by showing your capacity to get towards the truth. 
and we have a festival coming up in July in Dorset called the Realization Festival. That's kind of about Bildung. It's about trying to make sense of what Bildung means today um, and creating an atmosphere in which that conversation can take place. And then our Emerge network is growing strong and we have uh, a new director there and Emerge has its own event in Berlin in the autumn. So it's busy uh, and it's just beginning to take off. So thanks for asking. Yeah, Jonathan, thank you for making the time. Pleasure, thanks a lot. Our ability to make sense of the world is breaking down. We're making more and more consequential choices with worse and worse sense making to inform those choices, which is kind of running increasingly fast through the woods, increasingly blind. Over the last two years, Rebel Wisdom has interviewed some of the world's top thinkers. Now we've brought them together for an eight-week online course, Sense Making 101, with Daniel Schmachtenberger, Diane Musho Hamilton, John Viveki, Doshin Roshi, and more. Improve your sense making, develop your sovereignty, and join a wider community looking to do the same. <laughs>